But James chapter 1, we ask the question, why would you substitute the worthless for the real? I remember growing up and hearing the story of a little girl who loved pearls. She loved them. Pearls, pearls, pearls. And she looked forward to the day that she could have her very own genuine pearl necklace. When she was young, she found this fake pearl necklace at a yard sale or something of the sort. And she didn't care that the pearls were fake. She just loved wearing that pearl necklace. She wore it everywhere, to school, to the playground, to church, even to the dentist. And one day when she was older, her father called her into his office. And of course, she frolicked in there, fake pearls and all. And he told her, please have a seat. His mood was a bit somber, so she quietly asked, what is it, daddy? And he replied, give me your necklace. Yes, my necklace. You, you want my necklace? You want my pearls? Yes, I, I want your pearls. And she sadly but willingly unclasped the faux pearls from around her neck and handed them to him. And he took them in his hand and he looked at them. And then he reached to his left and he dropped them in the waist bin next to his desk. Oh, daddy, she cried. Why? Why'd you do that? And she tried her best to stifle the sobs fighting her way out of her soul. I had to, said her father. If you're going to start wearing these, upon which he pulled out a real pearl necklace out of his desk. Oh, daddy, she cried, this time with jubilance. Why did you do that? Well, she let out sobs of joy as she ran around the desk and threw her arms around her father. And once they let go of each other, she took a step back and he wrapped the real pearl necklace around her neck and clasped it in the back. Wow, they're beautiful, daddy, she exclaimed, as are you. He replied with satisfaction. Her father loved her. He asked her to give up the fake pearls, the worthless. And he asked her to hand them over only to proceed to discard them because he had something far better. He had a genuine pearl necklace for his beloved daughter. He had real pearls for her. How priceless. Can you imagine an odd turn in the story? What if the daughter, upon receiving the real pearls, flitted out of her dad's office and down the hall? You know she'd immediately go to the nearest mirror. And upon arriving at the mirror, what if her face suddenly dropped into sad consternation? She's upset now. The joy she had is gone. She storms back into the office. She rips the pearls her father bought and paid for off of her neck. She slams them on his desk and she snags the fake pearls out of the trash can. She wraps them around her neck and she hooks them. She looks at her shocked and hurt father. She says, I'm sorry, dad. I just love these too much. Do you think she's out of her mind? Why would you substitute the worthless pearls for the real ones? Why would you choose to love fake pearls so much that you reject the real pearls that your father gave you because he loves you so much? Why would you substitute the worthless for the real? That's a great question, isn't it, Christian? It's a great question for you, beloved brother or sister in Christ. And it's also a great question for the unbeliever, for the skeptic or the person who's yet outside of the faith. Why would you choose something that is worthless over something that is real? There is such a thing as a worthless religion. And there is such a thing as real religion. And I will tell you this much, the trials of life have a way of showing us how good for nothing worthless religion is and how priceless real religion is. Life's challenges shine a spotlight on our religious practices so we see them for what they are. And if the spotlight of hard times is exposing that you have been substituting the worthless for the real, why are you doing that? Why are you making such a foolish trade-off? God is good He's unchangeably good. God is a generous and a pure-hearted giver. He's the giver of every good and every perfect gift. He's the giver of wisdom in the midst of trials. He loves you. He wants you. 
He offers you life and joy and growth, maturity and hope. He speaks to you, I have salvation and blessing. He says, I have real pearls for you. He takes one look at your fake pearls that you found on the cheap in the markets of sin and suffering and man-made religion. And he asks you to place that necklace in his hand and he proceeds to throw it in the trash where it belongs. He has something priceless to give you in exchange. He has something real for every person on earth. He has something real for every person who becomes a child of God. He has something real for every church of Jesus full of his sons and his daughters. So why would you substitute the worthless for the real? In this letter to Jewish Christians in the first century, God the Father spoke through the words of James to call his sons and daughters into his office. He knew life was difficult for them as Christians. He knew they had fallen into diverse trials, difficulties of different kinds, and yet he had so much for them to know about life. He had priceless things for them to accept by faith. They were his children. At some point in their recent history, they had heard his word of truth. And when they heard, they evidently confessed that Jesus is Lord, was Lord, is Lord. They believed in their heart that God raised him from the dead. And they called on the name of the Lord and they were saved. Of God's will and purpose, he begat them. He birthed them into his family. And they became a kind of first fruits of his creatures, a little taste of a much greater harvest to come. At that point, and still today, his kingdom has not yet arrived. His new creation has not yet been created. And so his children, these Jews who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, and those of us who are saved by faith in Christ today, we are his new creation in the world. He loved these Jewish Christians, and and, and prayerfully he desired they loved him. If they loved him, they would demonstrate that by a new approach to the trials of life. See, their old approach to trials was worthless. It used to be joyless. It used to be faithless. It used to lack any God-given wisdom. It used to lack any endurance and maturity. Rather than trust the never-changing goodness of God, they blamed him for their troubles and became victims of life and their ever-changing sinful desires. The consequences of their sin had haunted them, and all they had in life was death. But all of that changed when God gave them spiritual life. And since he gave them spiritual life, he expected them to change their approach to the trials of life. He told them to be calm. Be calm. We can say that again and again and again, can't we? Be quick to listen. Be slow to say anything. Be slow to get angry. Their anger would not produce the real, the priceless righteousness that God desired to be evident in their lives. They had to calm down and they had to grow up. They had to take off the old fake pearls, throw them away. The old approach, the filthiness, that superfluity of naughtiness, the dirty living, that excessive sin, those old ways, they never did them any good in hard times in their past. But now they had something priceless. As verse 21 would say, they have the engrafted word. God had planted that word of truth in their souls. God's truth, his gospel of salvation was now in them. And when they gather with his children in the church, the word of truth was supposed to be all around them. And he wanted them to have the humility and the calmness to receive that priceless, perfect, liberating word. And his word of truth that originally gave them spiritual life, it in the present time had the power to save their souls in the midst of trial. I'm listening to an audio book called Parenting. I put information about that in your bulletin. It's by pastor and writer Paul David Tripp. And I heard a chapter on grace this past week and 
Tripp made the point that many Christian parents, this is relevant to me, they believe in God's past grace, they believe in God's future grace. However, they struggle to believe in his present grace. What does Tripp mean? See, many Christian parents believe God's grace in Christ forgives them of the sins of their past, the sins of their youth, the sins of their life before knowing Christ. They believe that God's grace in Christ secures heaven for them in the future, yet they fail to believe that God's grace in Christ is available to rescue them right now as they navigate the difficult and often frustrating adventure of parenthood. And James told these Jewish Christians, yes, God birthed you with the word of truth, but he can continue to rescue you from sin with that very word planted in your hearts. You need his salvation. You need his word of truth. You need his rescue. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the front porch, the front door of your Christian life that it gets you into the house with the family of God and then you rarely use it again. I don't need that anymore. I don't need to hear the gospel anymore. No, the gospel of God's grace is all throughout the house. It's everywhere. It's what we need. It's, it's how we breathe. It's how we live. It's how we do anything as a Christian. It's because of the gospel of the grace of God. Child of God, God's word of truth. It saved you and it will save you. And along the way, it saves you. It keeps you saved. It's the message of the gospel that is our hope. The question is, will you live by faith in his truth? Will you be a doer of the word or will you just be a hearer of the word? Hearing the word without doing the word is deceptive to you. To you. See, the person who hears the word but doesn't do anything with it, we remember last week, we picture that big old massive mirror big tall mirror and it's a wide mirror and we're looking in the mirror and, and seeing, seeing our, our, our whole self and the person who hears the word but doesn't do anything with it. It's like a person who looks for a good long time in the mirror who sees the whole picture of who he is, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then he walks away without changing anything. He walks away and he forgets what he saw in the mirror and he thinks everything is okay when everyone else may very well see that guy needs to revisit the mirror. His relationship with that mirror is worthless. If he's not gonna do anything about what he sees. His approach to using that mirror correctly is vain. Typically approaches to using mirrors are vain anyways, aren't they? <laughs> Don't worry the illustration. The person who hears the word, but is only a hearer, who forgets what God showed him in the word, who does not humbly receive that word and do something about it, he's tricking himself. He has a worthless relationship with the word. His approach to hearing the word correctly is empty. On the other hand, the person who stoops over is the idea of look at verse 25, who stoops over with great interest and looks into the perfect law of liberty, the law of King Jesus that sets us free from sin to live according to his ways. The person who looks into that continues in it, not forgetting it, but doing it. This man shall be blessed in his deed. He experiences the real blessings of God in life. And those blessings are his in the middle of his trials and on the other side of them and in heaven. He has what is real, a loving relationship with God. So why would you substitute the worthless for the real? And God, through the writing of James, took this further. Why would you substitute worthless religion for real religion. In the next verses, God exposes worthless religion and he exalts real religion. And we are left with the question again, why would you substitute the worthless for the real? You say, well, what is worthless religion? Look back in verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious... He was comparing a man who only hears the word with a man who hears and does the word, just verses before this. And here he continued the thought about a man who merely hears the word but doesn't do it. This man, he seems to be religious. 
He's sitting here in a conservative Bible teaching church, perhaps on a Sunday morning, he thinks he's religious and others may think he, he is religious. This word religious, it comes from a Greek word that has mostly to do with the outward actions of religion, the ceremony, the doing. These Jewish Christians would have been very familiar with outward actions of religion because of all the temple ceremonies and the rituals of their Jewish faith. They would have been very familiar with men who seemed very religious, men who thought of themselves, we are the most religious Jews. Who do you think they were? The Pharisees. They were very ceremonial. They dotted their I's and they crossed all their T's and they checked their boxes and they kept the scores and their assessments of themselves were, we're religious. Thank you, God, that we are not like other men. Like this guy over here who doesn't pray as well as I do or give as much as I do. He's obviously the scum of the earth. And I am very religious. These Jewish Christians would have been very familiar with men who seemed to be religious, men who thought themselves to be very religious. And if they were not careful, that, that background, that culture that God had saved them out of could creep back into their lives as they would worship God. James wrote, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart. So James was picturing this man among these Jewish Christians who esteemed himself to be religious based upon his outward actions of religion. I'm reminded again and again through this of what God said to Samuel when he was choosing the next king, when he was gonna, before he anointed David, and he sees the oldest brother, I believe it was alive, he's like, surely that's the next king. And God said, no, that's not the next king. God doesn't think like man thinks. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. It's not what is on the outside. It's not the ceremony. Here's this man. He, he thinks he's got it all right. He does all the right stuff on the outside. He says all the right things. Yet, given the right context, he does not bridle his tongue. He doesn't control it. Like a wild bucking bronco, his tongue runs loose without any effort on his part or ability on his part to rein it in. A man who did not care to be quick to listen or slow to speak. A man who did not care to curb his anger. And he, he even gave the mental check and the physical nod to the word. He thought himself to be religious, yet his mouth was out of control and his heart was deceived. He did not do the word. He sang about the goodness of God in the synagogue, then yelled at his family on the walk home. First century. He shook hands vigorously and blessed the pastor for a fine sermon on Sunday and then spoke like a real jerk to his wife for the seventh time this week behind closed doors. He agreed with the other men of the congregation that God's ways are the best ways and then he went about living each and every way he felt like in a given moment. He could talk the talk. He's not walking the walk. If any man thinks he's religious, James Warren, and he doesn't control his tongue but deceives his heart, this man's religion is vain. It's worthless to God. It's not even real. His outward show of religion, the singing, the talking, the reading of scriptures, the outward formalities, even actions of surface, service, it was all worthless. And it's not, it's like you think about Isaiah we read at the beginning today. It's not that God had not, that God had not commanded them to come and offer those sacrifices and have those feasts and all those things. And it, the, the problem is not that we assemble together decently and in order and worship God and allow the word of God to teach us that there is to be reading of scripture and there is to be songs of praise and there is to be the preaching and teaching of the word. There is to be a sense of order as we gather as the people of God. That wasn't the problem with this man the problem with with this man was that it that was all there was to it he, he compartmentalized his relationship with god it is something that i do I, I i go and i i assemble with these people and i say i believe these things but the rest of the week i am my life is governed by my own heart and thus it's governed by wickedness and evil and what I have, the religion I have is not real. That's what James is saying. Fake pearls, that's what that is. And where, does, where do they belong? Where does that worthless religion belong? 
in the trash. Why would you substitute the worthless for the real? So what is real religion? Well, back to James in verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Now, before we look at what this is and hold up real religion, the this that we want to have, that we want to practice as genuine children of God, understand that God is the one who tells man what real religion is. Child of God, your Father in heaven is the one who sees who you really are. Self-deceived sinner. You may not be saved. You may think you're going to heaven, but you actually live like hell and you love it. God sees past the facade of your worthless talk. Pure religion, real religion, undefiled religion, the kind of worship and piety that's pure and that's clean, it can only be identified by the God who sees the heart. And how does he define real religion? Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Here it is, this is it, this is real religion. Two things, two ongoing real actions of Christian life that are born out of the life of someone who has been reborn. Actions that we're not doing these things so maybe Christ will accept us, but we are doing these things because Christ died for us and I believe that message and I've become alive and I want to live out. I want to live this thing. I don't want to just talk it. Here's these two ongoing actions. Number one is to visit. To visit. Visit whom? The fatherless. Whom? The orphans. Children without a father or mother. Children without someone to care for them. Children without someone to provide for them. Children without someone to love them. Who else does the man with real religion visit? The widows. Women without a husband still living. Women without the means to care for themselves. Women without the needed help to make it in life, to do the things they need to do to maintain their house, to maintain their life. Women without children of their own who love them and make sure they're honored and they're nourished. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is visiting orphans and widows in their affliction. And what is affliction? It's hard times, it's pressure. It's oppression, it's distress, it's, it's dire straits. See, and this time the Jewish Christians thought their lives were hard. We're experiencing all kinds of trials. And oftentimes we get so locked into how hard our life is, but guess who really had it hard? The orphans and widows. You think your week was crummy. Just think about someone, think about a little boy, a little girl who has nobody, who doesn't have the safe harbor of a home and parents that love them. Think about a widow alone without a spouse to come back to them at the end of the day. Hear the cry of the orphan. Hear the cry of the widow. I don't have anyone to love me or hold me or help me. I don't have anyone to listen to me or talk to me. I don't have an answer to the problems in my life. I don't know where the next meal is coming from or how I'm going to take care of myself in the future. I'm so alone. And then hear the, hear the talk of the man with worthless religion. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. Hey, will y'all pipe down over there? You widows and orphans, you're making too much of a ruckus. I can't think to praise God. Some low life men left those kids and women in a bad way. They should have taken better care of theirs. Good thing I'm responsible and I provide for my family. Someone else will have to do something to help them. I'm too busy. And then hear the actions of the man with the real religion. Hey, honey, did you hear about those kids down the street from us? Yeah, the ones who have no parents. Do you think we could make room for them? You think you could make a little extra at supper time every day or we could work it in the budget somehow to to give of our time, to give of our resources to help them? Oh, and did you know that, that Mrs. Mary, yes, that dear lady who sits near us at synagogue, remember first century Jewish Christian, That lady, her husband just died. I I know, it's terrible. And she has nobody. Let's see if we can add on to the house to give her a place to stay. 
to stay. What's that? I know the economy's bad, dear. But God the Father is good. And He will give us what we need. He will supply for us. As we give generously to others, He's promised to take care of us. Let me go down the street to check on those poor orphans, those kids. And let me head across town to have a good conversation with the dear widow lady. See, the man with pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father knows something. He was an orphan. Spiritually speaking, he was as destitute, as lost, as hopeless, and as abandoned, as an orphan, and as a widow. But God, of his own will, begat that man with the word of truth. He, he brought him into the family of God, not because of anything he did. And now that man simply wants to live out his father's love. He was an orphan, but God chose to adopt him. His hopes for real life and future grace were as dead as a widow's husband. And God took him under his care, gave him life in the now and grace and hope for the future. His heart is rescued from the trials by his gracious father and his saving word. And now he wants to live out that life rather than just talk about how lovely a religion we have. Isn't this great? Real compassion is real religion. It is compassion born out of the love of God the Father in the lives of his children. And that real compassion leads to action, to visit, to inspect, to figure out ways to aid and truly help the needy in their hard times. A commenter commentator named Douglas Moo aptly said, one test of pure religion, therefore, is the degree to which we extend aid to the helpless in our world. Whether they be widows and orphans, immigrants trying to adjust to a new life, impoverished third world dwellers, the handicapped and the homeless. Talk is cheap. Loving action that actually helps the helpless, such as orphans and widows, that's priceless. That is real religion in the life of a child of God because the child of God is simply being like his father. Verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and number two, to keep. To keep. To to keep something is to guard something, to protect it. See, real religion is the action of compassion, going and visiting the orphans and the widows in their affliction. But real, real religion is also the action of protection. See, some would say that you, you, can, you just need to go and you do need to meet the sinners where they are and even be like the sinners to reach the sinners. But God wants us to be in the world, seeking to meet the needs of the world, but not of the world. And real religion is the action of protection, of keeping your life pure from the filth of this world. See, James knew that his readers struggled with keeping clean. Their sinful lives, their sinful lusts within them were enough to entice them away from their good God and back into the filthy garbage of the world. They had to take out the trash of their own hearts. They had to keep themselves clean. See, if a man thought himself to be religion, but his mouth was filthy, well, he didn't have real religion, did he? If a woman thought herself to be religious, but she just said whatever popped into her head, regardless of how it made someone else feel, and then claimed, well, that's just the way I am. She lacked real religion, didn't she? In other words, she wasn't putting her faith in Christ who is gracious and calm. And have you ever gotten a, a bad word from God? You say, well, yeah, he is chasing me before, but wasn't that even for your ultimate good? And wasn't it done in such a gentle and loving way that you wanted to have a relationship with him? So a woman who says, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I'm religious. But then she just, she cuts with her word. She cuts her husband. She cuts her children. Cut, 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 cut. It's not real religion. Her mouth is dirty. Men and women whose mouths, their attitudes, their actions look just like the lost world around them are deceiving themselves if they think they're religious. 
Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to keep one's life unspotted from the world. I must guard myself. The world can't stain my heart. You have the ear gates. What do I let into my ears? You have the eye gates. What do I let into my eyes? The world can't get in. I can't let the world stain my mind. I can't let the world dirty up my thoughts and my feelings. The world, it it can't dump its filth into my actions. I guard my heart. I protect my mind. I make sure that I'm very careful who I allow to influence my soul, whether that's a person in real time or someone on a screen or someone in a podcast or someone in a book or an e-book. Real religion is acknowledging I am called to a holy and pure life of love for God and my fellow man. And then I protect myself from all that would defile that. See, the point of being clean is so we can with holy hearts, pure hearts, devoted to God, devoted to the good of others. We can go and actually do good. But if we go and do good, but our hearts and our lives and our minds are so filthy, we're just out there and we're going to make a mess. Make a mess. We're not going to accomplish any real good. I don't want to substitute the worthless for the real. I don't want to snag the fake pearls out of the trash. Look at this treasure I've got. I want to hold on to the priceless pearls my Father in heaven has given me through Jesus Christ. I want to share his great wealth of love and goodness with others who so desperately need him and they need me. I want to keep the junk of this world out of my life. Why would I substitute the worthless for the real? Why would you substitute the worthless for the real? Isn't it worth something, sir, if you finally just get saved? You finally just own up to the fact that your religion is a sham and you have no spiritual life. Wouldn't it be worth something to you, to your wife, to your kids, to your friends, to your Christian acquaintances to humbly repent and receive the word of truth that is able to save your soul? Isn't it worth something, ma'am, daughter of God, perhaps, who is saved if you settle down? How many years is it going to take to learn to settle down and face your trials and decide you're going to take out the trash of your old approach so you can faithfully choose God's new way? You finally decide to rejoice, to endure, to mature. Wouldn't it be worth something to you, to your husband, to your kids, to your friends, to your Christian acquaintances and others to just trust your father in heaven, be a doer of the word and begin to get your eyes off of yourself and your problems and onto the needy around you? Isn't it worth something, Emmanuel Baptist Church, if we choose real religion, we decide that spiritual talk is cheap? Wouldn't it be worth something to our families and and to our community to be a church that intentionally pursues orphans and widows and the helpless of our society and protects our souls from the filth of this world? Be a real church. True blue, man. Genuine. Listen, God is calling the disciples of Emmanuel Baptist Church, the people who become children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, he's calling us to real religion. And his religion is priceless. It is priceless in its peace. It has such a calming effect on the life that produces a gentleness in the way we speak and live. It is priceless in its progress. It has such a continual growth and endurance and maturing process that keeps growing and going and building us in real ways. It is priceless in its purity. It has a clean life for us that washes us from the guilt of our past and any shame we might feel in the present for digging around in the trash can for those old worthless pearls. It is priceless in its profit. It has blessings for us that cannot be taken away from us. It has blessings for orphans and widows whom God wants to nourish through our faithful, caring hands. We have a growing number of widows around here. If you're you're a widow present, you'd be so kind. Would you raise your hand if you're a widow present today? And there are others of this number. There's at least three or four more. I'm sure if we did some investigating, we would find out that we could help them in very tangible ways. That's real religion. 
Real religion is cleaning out gutters so she does not have to pay somebody to do that. And you could come up with other illustrations and other practical things. And I'm sure if we did further investigation, we could find out that there are plenty of widows in the community that no one is helping. They don't have a church home. They have nobody. When it comes to orphans, as Colin mentioned, I received a phone call just this past week from Kawita Casa, a local chapter of a nationwide organization that seeks to connect stable people with children in the craziness of foster care. A, a person and advocate, a court, appoint, a court appointed av- advocate to connect, to be with the child, to be aware of the biological parents, to be aware of the foster parents, and to be there for that kid. You say, that's not an orphan, but it's, it's pretty close. It's on the spectrum. And, it, and God dropped this opportunity in our lap this week. I got the phone call on the voicemail this week. On Friday, September 6, 6 p.m., Central Baptist Church in Noonan. You can go. You, be, you can become more aware of how you can visit the fatherless in Coweta County. I asked God to show us how to be involved, and I got the phone call. Is that coincidence or is it divine providence? God is calling the disciples of Emmanuel Baptist Church to real religion. God the Father has something real for us. It's ours. Why would we substitute the worthless for the real?